Today is the 24th of February 2023, the 100th birthday of arguably the most famous steam locomotive in the world, the Flying Scotsman. But why? Not why is this its 100th birthday, but why is it so famous? It's not the biggest, strongest or fastest locomotive, it's not the oldest by a long shot, obviously it's not the newest. There's nothing particularly technologically special about it. So what makes it such a celebrity? Flying Scotsman was built at Doncaster by the London and North Eastern Railway. It was one of the A1 class, designed by Nigel Gresley. The A1s were of the Pacific type. Four supporting wheels in front, six driving wheels, two supporting wheels behind. Pacifics were state-of-the-art express locomotives at the time. The first two A1s were built for the Great Northern Railway, which was absorbed into the London and North Eastern Railway in 1923. The third A1 was number 1472. 1472 was tested against the North Eastern Railway's own Pacific, designed by Vincent Raven, and proved to be the superior locomotive overall. Thus, 1472 set the precedent. The London and North Eastern Railway's top-of-the-line express locomotive would be the A1. A year later, 1472 would have its number changed to 4472, and it would find itself assigned a prestige job. Since 1862, a Toplink Express train had run from London to Edinburgh, known as the Special Scotch Express. The Special Scotch Express had long carried the nickname of the Flying Scotsman, and the LNER made it official. To promote it, number 4472 was named after this new train. Most of the other A1s would be named after racehorses. Other class members included Salmon Trout, Pretty Polly and Robert the Devil. Having been given this promotional name, Flying Scotsman became something of a flagship locomotive for the company. In 1924 and 1925 it was displayed at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley, a representative of the very best the LNER had to offer. In 1928 the Flying Scotsman, the train that is, was turned into a non-stop service. Gresley devised a tender that could hold enough coal to make the journey, was fitted with a scoop to enable the engine to pick up water from troughs en route, and included a corridor to enable the driver and fireman to change over. Naturally, Flying Scotsman the locomotive was one of the engines assigned to this non-stop train. In 1929, one of the first British talkies was released, a film entitled The Flying Scotsman. The LNER allowed this to be filmed on the Hartford Loop and released number 4472 for the film company's use. Apparently Gresley was rather dismayed at what he saw as unsafe practices being portrayed in the film, and insisted on a disclaimer. In 1934, Flying Scotsman entered the record books, hauling a test train at 100 miles per hour. While this was almost certainly not the first time a steam locomotive had done the ton, this was the first time it had been authenticated. But its days at the top were numbered. Gresley had devised a new class of locomotive, the A4s. These were a streamlined, high-pressure class of locomotive that could leave the A1s in the dust. In 1938, locomotive number 4468, named Mallard, took the speed record and kept it attaining a speed of 126 miles per hour, a record never bettered by a steam locomotive. So Flying Scotsman became just another engine. In 1947 it would be rebuilt into an A3, a more efficient variant on the A1 with a larger, higher pressure boiler. The following year the LNER would be nationalised as part of British Railways. By the 1960s steam was on the way out, to be replaced by diesel and electric traction, and in 1962 the scrapping of Flying Scotsman was announced. While it may not have been top of the line anymore, it was still something of a celebrity among railway enthusiasts who clamoured for its preservation. The National Railway Museum wouldn't take it, they were saving Mallard and didn't want another Gresley Pacific. The Gresley A3 Preservation Society was formed and tried to raise the funds to buy it. But in the end, it was a businessman named Alan Pegler who saved the day. 
He had fond memories of seeing Scotsmen at Wembley and dreamed of driving the locomotive up the East Coast main line. He bought the engine from British Railways for £3,500 and set about restoring the engine as close as possible to its condition in LNER days. It returned to service in 1963. It was also fitted with a second tender to give it additional water capacity, as water troughs were being removed from British Railways. I would say that it was this era that promoted Scotsman from a merely quite famous locomotive to an icon. Pegler had contacts at British Railways who allowed him to run the engine on the main line. This was an era when steam engines were being run down, rarely cleaned and often scrapped as soon as they broke down. Yet Scotsman was a bright and shining engine that represented the vanishing glamour days of British steam. In 1968, the engine made a guest appearance in the railway series book Enterprising Engines, where it's revealed that he's Gordon the Big Engine's only surviving brother. See, you get all those clickbaity articles and videos about how dark Thomas the Tank Engine is. No one ever talks about the story where Gordon learns his family are dead. In 1969, the Scotsman went to the USA and Canada, hauling a train to promote British enterprise. Unfortunately, while the tour started well, it became a massive money pit, and in 1972, Alan Pegler declared bankruptcy. Flying Scotsman was marooned in San Francisco. Enthusiasts feared the worst. The following year, construction magnate and rail enthusiast Bill McAlpine saved the Scotsman from an uncertain fate, and it was welcomed back to the UK that year. In 1988, it had a rather happier trip overseas to Australia. Here it set another record, the longest non-stop run by a steam locomotive at 422 miles between Parks and Broken Hill. In 1989, it returned to the UK once more. But it was losing money still. And in 1993, McAlpine went into partnership with record producer Pete Waterman to pay off the locomotive's mortgage. But in 1996, they admitted defeat and sold it to entrepreneur Tony Marchington. Marchington, too, found himself ruined by the loco, and in 2003, he was declared bankrupt. A huge question mark hung over the locomotive. The fact was, celebrity and icon though it may have been, it seemed that it was destined to ruin whoever bought it. At 80 years old, maintenance was becoming more and more expensive, and who knew who would buy it next or where it might end up? Ironically, it would be the National Railway Museum who would step in. It was bought for £2.3 million with the help of the National Heritage Memorial Fund, the Yorkshire Post, and Richard Branson, as well as many, many public donors. From 2006 to 2016, it underwent a heavy overhaul. There are enthusiasts who question why so much attention is given to this locomotive, especially when it's public money going to fund its repairs. But the fact is that Scotsman is famous. It's probably one of the few real-life locomotives that the average non-enthusiast could name. It costs money, but on the other hand, it must be one of the most merchandised locomotives in the world. When it visits heritage railways, it's a major attraction. There have been countless books, articles, documentaries, and even YouTube videos about it. It makes headlines in the mainstream media. The counter-argument to the naysayers is simple. Maybe it's not the most historically significant locomotive in the world, but it remains one of the best known. It's an ambassador to the railway heritage movement. Which brings us back to the question of why. Well, in a sense, it's famous because it's famous. The LNER chose it as their flagship engine almost arbitrarily. That resulted in it becoming better known, so it was saved for preservation, and it became even better known. So it had to be saved for the nation, so it became even better known yet. And now it's a hundred years old and more famous than ever. So, happy birthday, Flying Scotsman. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do subscribe for more and leave a like down below. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube. You are the businessman to my threatened locomotive. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.